I'm Chris Preston. And I'm Brad Semmerman. And welcome to Street Check, the best two-person podcast in the history of Cabot Wealth Network, which has been uh, bringing investment advice to individual subscribers uh, since uh, 1970. Uh, Brad, uh, and for the audience who's watching on YouTube, I'm coming from uh, a different location. Um, I'm in my guest room because my basement, which is below where I normally record, was flooded uh, about a foot and a half the other night as Vermont was a day... I can never pronounce it right. Deluge. 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 With, yeah. uh, I think it was six inches of rain or five or six inches where I live. Um, same date as last year when that happened. Uh, we've survived it last year, but not this year. Anyway, that's why I'm here. Um, and Brad, you had an exciting night last night too in a different kind of way. Yeah, we uh, we went to Hamilton for my daughter's birthday. It's the touring version, so not like the original cast. It was fun. She had a blast. Uh, that was our second time seeing the touring company. It's a good show. Um, nice. Very feels a lot different in 2024 versus like 2017. Uh, yeah, <laughs> as you can probably imagine. Yeah, uh, it's, it's 2017 feels like forever ago. Uh, and I, I, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was 2019. I don't know. Everything pre 2020 so. is a, is a blur at this point. Right. Years are just drifting by and slipping through my fingers. Right. teenagers now uh. wild you'll you'll be there soon yeah yeah i would say we just brought my 10 year old to his first overnight camp uh for 10 days which was exciting but you know slightly emotional for us um okay so it's been a couple of weeks uh we, we took the week off last week to the fourth and vacation my vacation um so we're back and uh we're doing sort of a mega podcast uh today we have we did this a couple of months ago. We brought on several of our uh, Cabot analysts uh, just to do sort of quick hitting interviews on what they're seeing from the their different corners of the market. We're going to do that again today. We're bringing on uh, four analysts, Michael Brush, Jacob Mintz, Tyler London, and Tom Hutchinson, uh, who all have, all have different takes um, on what's happening. Um, we will uh, bring them on momentarily. Anything else to add, uh, Brad, before we start bringing on? on guests no i i mean i think we'll get into it just yesterday was a weird one mike Santolo called it out in some of the some of the um those things he was writing for his subscribers seeing like just a weird big rotation day yeah uh, which i think is great for some of the analysts that'll be on who uh you know tyler in particular you know has a lot of exposure to small caps yeah. so seeing that rotation it feels pretty bullish but I think we'll leave that to the analysts to offer their own assessments. Yeah, lots to catch up on, lots to get into, and we'll do that uh, in just a second. All right, first up in our uh, analyst roundtable today is Michael Brush. He is chief analyst of Cabot Cannabis Investor, and uh, he also is a columnist for Market Watch. Speaking of which, Michael, uh, we want to have you on today, partly because you just wrote a column for Market Watch. You know, I, I can see you're generally a pretty say a pretty optimistic bullish guy or at least at least when it comes to cannabis you wrote the other day for market watch is the market peaking not yet but we're getting closer 10 signs that stocks are short of breath what are some of the signs and how close are we okay so this is based on a b of a uh report they i think they have a pretty good quant uh division and uh so they identified 10 factors that they think are signs of a market top some of them get pretty esoteric. We don't want to go through all 10, but uh, basically the bottom line is when 70% of those hit, we're probably near a market top. And right now we're at, I think, 40%. So we're pretty far away. We can we can go through some of the ones that have triggered and then ones to look for. Um, but I think it's also important at some point to tell people what to do with this information because it's, you know, how you react is really important in terms of like uh, how well you do in the market. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, Sorry, you uh, ahead, so let's, let's start off with the, the 40% that have triggered. So the, these are, uh, these are top signals that bank of America looks at that are right. already indicating an overbought market. What are those, what are those right. four of? Well, the, uh, so they take two from the conference board and they basically have to do with like how bullish consumers are and uh, how many people expect uh, stocks to go up. 
and both of those are at levels where this sentiment is pretty high. You know, basically these are contrarian indicators, right? When people are too bullish, it's a negative right. because uh, you know who, who's left to come in and buy your stocks essentially is part of that concept. So those are two, and then the other uh, another one is the uh, uh, the banks that are tightening lending standards. Uh, that's that's high high enough, and then uh, the third the fourth one is the yield curve, which has been telling us the recession forever, and, and so far not working. So those are the four that have triggered. And so we've got four of ten that are possible. Um, I know we didn't want to dive too far into the other six, but what right. what are three what are the three that we would be looking at maybe in the in the nearest term in the most immediate future um, that could potentially well indicate to investors that we're getting getting closer to the top. Right. Um, you know, one is a, a real big pickup in m and I mean, that's an easy one to monitor. If you start seeing a lot of headlines of M&A going on, um, that's not going to be a good thing. Um, valuation, valuations, I mean, they have kind of an esoteric way of measuring it. They take the trailing P and add it to the uh, inflation, uh, rate of inflation. Um, but uh, um, that one's that one's not triggered yet. Their measure of valuation hasn't triggered yet. Then growth outperforming value by a lot it is, but not by enough. Um, and then uh, I guess another one would be uh, credit stress indicators. They have a proprietary signal, but uh, you know things like the amount of bad debt and so forth. Those haven't triggered yet. Um, and then I have my own way of looking at this that simplifies it a little bit too. If we want to go into that. Yeah, yeah. You uh, talk about what what your biggest indicator is. Right. So, um, so for me, like in all the years I've been in the market, to what really works is when there's very narrow participation and sentiment is very bullish. Because what that that tells you two things: the narrow participation tells you that basically a correction has already happened; it just hasn't shown up in the generals, in the in the narrow, like the S and P or the Dow. But everywhere else, you know, things are not looking good in terms of stock performance. So and then uh, when everybody's bullish, um, that means that people are more vulnerable to surprise. So when the correction spreads out to hit the generals, that's a surprise to people and they panic and they sell. Again, it's a contrarian indicator. So here, um, you know, a lot of people are talking about narrow participation, but, I, you know, there's also ways to measure participation that show that it's not narrowing um, like in the NICE New York Stock Exchange um, the the percentage of stocks above their 200 day moving average is um, is still pretty high I think it's at like 60 percent um, and yesterday was a huge participation day right everybody noticed that the R2K really outperformed um, and so on sentiment if you really want to just boil it down I track about a dozen indicators but um, just look at the investors intelligence bull bear ratio that's a good proxy for overall sentiment and we're at three five now and you want to be kind of at four uh to really have a red flag so so we're getting close but we're not quite there on uh, so in, in other words anything above four is a red flag below it you're yeah really okay yeah just because four is is really pretty rare so when we hit four you know that's not an outlier but it's kind of rare it's an, it's basically extremely high so um i guess the question is so what do people do with this information i think it's important to um uh to remember that uh you know i think investing is about being in the market long term and there's all sorts of stats that you can cite but essentially you know if if you miss the 10 best days in the market in a decade you you know you underperform by I don't remember the numbers, 40%, some large amount. So you want to be in the market. So another thing to remember is you can't really ever call a market top. So so what do we do with these signals that maybe we're close to a top? Well, I would say, um, you know, if you're, uh, I mean, I wouldn't be on margin here for one thing. Um, and I would sort of enter positions more judiciously, you know, more slowly and uh, take a starter position or maybe a third and then buy on any weakness. So that, that would be kind of my suggestion for what to do with this, you know, is the market topping concept. Uh, and then shifting to your bread and butter uh, cannabis, right. um, what do you say? I know that that's not too bullish <laughs> right mm -hmm. now, which uh, often, and you've been right about this, often that's a good, best time to buy. 
Right. What are you seeing now and what's, where are we with rescheduling? I know that the comments period, I'm not sure if that's ended yet or not. Yeah, that's going to be July 22. Okay. Um, you know, uh, yeah, everybody really does not like cannabis stocks right now. And that is a good time to buy, um, especially because there's a catalyst rich environment ahead of us. The big one is rescheduling. Um, so there's a comment period uh, that closes on the 22nd. That's sort of a non-event, but, um, but you know, to be honest, in the past three days, cannabis stocks have shown quite a bit of strength. So I think people are treating that as a possible catalyst. Um, the real catalyst there will be if the Department of Justice actually, you know, reschedules. I don't know when that's going to happen, but I think it's probably going to happen before the election. So that's a huge catalyst over, you know, let's say by October. Then you have uh, uh, the vote uh, in Florida and several other yeah. states have uh, have referenda. And uh, if those are positive, those will be catalysts as well. Yeah, and I highly recommend uh, people to subscribe to um, to Michael's uh, advisory, uh, Cabot Canvas Investor. That's on the CabotWealth.com website under premium advisories. Um, yeah, you've frequently outperformed the market uh, with, I won't say what, but with uh, some key um, some key investments that you that you've uh, used at at, at good times, uh, and like you said, now now is a good time to buy. Uh, as sort of a you got to treat cannabis as sort of a contrarian investor. Yeah, but uh, what do you guys think about whether we're at a market top or not? You guys have a view on that? Uh, my 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 takeaway right now is you run with the bulls or you get trampled. Um, mm -hmm. You know what we saw yesterday was a was I think bullish rotation today. The the big tech is bouncing back it, it's sort of signaling to me that nobody wants to be uh nobody wants to not have exposure to anything we've we've seen a lot of money sitting on the sidelines everybody's been sort of piling into ai because that's the trade um and now there's other opportunities but we get an, an oversold bounce back on the short term from some of those big tech names so um i i'm bullish but i, I told chris a couple of weeks ago when the last bear throws in the towel, that's when you have to sort of be worried. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, th that's, 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 that's my exactly concern. Right. Yeah. yeah, that that's yeah. my concern is that I'm the I'm the the canary in the coal mine for the last bears, um, but I, I think we've got room to run ahead. Yeah, no, I, I agree, and it's funny we're about to have on uh, Jacob Mintz, and he he just wrote uh, the other day about how bullish um, some call the call buying has been recently. So he's optimistic i guess so yeah it, we're at an interesting crossroads now i i agree with with brad that you know until uh we see you know real bear signs I, i'm gonna remain bullish but it, it, it makes sense to take a cautious approach for sure hey you know one thing we didn't mention is seasonality i mean we're really moving like july is the month that has the highest number of you know severe pullbacks um, and then right. September and October tend to be the lows for the year, particularly October. And the magic day there is October 11th or 12th. Um, so, so that's I think that's another reason to be a little bit cautious here: seasonality. Yeah, and in election years, especially, the the pattern has been that the last two three months before an election, stocks pull back, um, and yeah, usually bottom in October, like you said. So, there's probably some of that ahead. I I, I wonder if. You know, July, August will be okay. Might you know, might get some more, um, some more buying there. But um, I do think it'll slow eventually. But we'll see when. Um, Michael, thanks for joining us. Thank uh, you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right, our next guest is uh, Jacob Mintz, who is uh, chief analyst of our Cabot Options Trader, Cabot Options Trader Pro, and Cabot Profit Booster Advisories, known as the Roaring Kitty of uh, the options world. Uh, Jacob, uh, welcome on. Um, we wanted to have you on partly because uh, you wrote an interesting article the other day uh, for the Cabot site. Um, call buying is telling me the market is going much higher. Uh, talk about what you're seeing from call buying right now. Yeah, so in the last two to three weeks, um, as you know, NVIDIA and Microsoft and Tesla have been roaring higher, there's been wild call buying in those stocks. And it's not just, you know, a buyer of a thousand calls, 500 calls, you know, a million dollars at risk, $2 million at risk. These are buyers of 70,000 calls and a couple hundred million dollars at risk. And I'm seeing it in, like I said, Tesla, Microsoft, um, Coinbase, uh, Amazon, it's just all over the place in the big, big players, which is very bullish in my opinion. Um, and I will note, I didn't write it in that article because it, 
has happened in the last couple of days, but all of a sudden there's wild call buying, not just in those stocks, but across the market. So my options barometer, which is really the uh, shows how bullish or bearish option activity is that day for the last two days is uh, uh, come in around seven. So that's very bullish on a scale of one to 10. So I'm very bullish. You know, it, it started right before the IWM took off. And then bang, the IWM exploded higher uh, yesterday and again today. So I'm I'm pretty bullish. The breadth is I was I was concerned about breadth for a while, just like a lot of uh, yep. traders. But all of a sudden, that breadth has swung violently uh, bullish of sorts. Uh, more stocks are participating, so I'm pretty encouraged. Yeah, that's fantastic to hear. I you know we just had Michael Brush on, and he he had written an article for Market Watch, I believe, yeah. um, that. Yeah, a column for them that was talking about how um, the sort of contrarian indicators that would be overbought signals aren't aren't triggering right now. They seem to indicate that there's a lot of a lot of room to run. I know you and and uh, Mike have been writing a lot about the weak market breadth. Um, it just seems like every asset like there's a bull case for almost every asset class right right now. Am am I overstating that? Well, that's a bit above my pay grade, but I'm just, I, I, I will say this. I have not seen, while, while breadth was a concern, I have not seen any other real concerns in my world. Yeah. The VIX has been at 12 approximately for months, which is, you know, says that the big options players are not hedging uh, against a big market decline. So that's bullish. Um, option activity has been mostly bullish. Um, the market is continuing higher. I mean, it, there has been that one worry, which has been breadth, but there's there there's not been the you know two or three other worries that would have me turn bearish so you know we're holding a lot of uh, a lot of very bullish positions right now in all in all the portfolios though i will say uh sorry to take you know take a shot at you brad i think when you turn bullish that will be the <laughs> sign that's the sign that i'm uh, that i'm looking for to uh start to exit our uh, our positions i'm just joking. yeah i did it i did it 2 weeks ago um uh, <laughs> my <laughs> the the number I threw out there was based on um, PE ratios from the dot com bubble puts puts an upside target at sixty six hundred on the S and P five hundred so that would be uh, almost twenty percent more room to run yep. um, so that there that's my um, that's my bull take is that we've got we've got a lot of room to run and that I've thrown in the towel so my <laughs> apologies to everybody that's long here uh, major correction <laughs> incoming I, I will say. Because the VIX is so cheap and option volatility is so cheap across the the world, the options world. If you are, if you think we're overheating, buying puts right now is very attractive. Now, not necessarily to bet against the market because I am bullish, but just as a hedge, you know, who knows what's going to happen with the presidential election? Or you know, there are there are some worries out there. And if you want to hedge, it is the time is the price is certainly right. Um, yeah. It, while still holding a bullish portfolio. Yeah, let me throw just a, a modifier on that one. Uh, use the cues, right? Like tech has been over, not, I don't want to say overbought in like the indicator sense, but tech has been the target for buyers for the last six months. Even if we just move sideways or drift higher, you probably have better better risk profile hedging on the cues, which are already a little bit overweight relative to uh, like the S&P or IWM or something like that. Yeah, and, and if you are looking to hedge my basic principles, uh, you know, it's it's tough for a lot of people to just, you know, open up an options screen and choose which option to buy. I would go, if you were looking at the queues, I would buy the at the money queue put with, I don't know, three to six months till expiration. So uh, I don't know exactly where the queues are trading, but let's just choose a round number. If they're at 400, uh, I would buy the 400 put. So that's the, you know, that's the at the money put. Um, and then if three to six months, so maybe you'd look at a November or December yeah. expiration cycle. Yeah. Go past, go past the, uh, the election that like, if you're going to buy three months worth of premium, you might as well buy four, uh, yeah. would be sort of, we might take away there. I would agree. Uh, you mentioned Jacob that, uh, the big boys are getting initially were the ones getting a lot of call, uh, call buying activity, Tesla, Microsoft, Amazon, but it's since expanded. Are there sectors in particular that stand out um, more than others? Not really, to be honest, which is kind of encouraging. You know, it's yeah. been, I don't know, uh, 
last couple of days, there's been big call buying in China related plays. All of a sudden, China calls and Baidu and Hindu Duo, Hindu Duo PDD. Yep. That's the easier way of saying it. Yep. Um, Alibaba, uh, Corning in tech AI, uh, Robinhood, symbol H O O D, uh, Hims and Hers, symbol H I M S. I mean, it's just all over the place. So that's pretty encouraging. And that, and that's not terribly surprising as we see the IWM, you know, starting to engage that we're going to see yeah. call, you know, chasers starting to buy across the market and yeah, not focus on one sector or another. Have you seen it this widespread at all during the past, say, year? I mean, I guess maybe like last November would have been the time, November, December would have been. Um, as you know, I'm an options trader, which means my memory goes back about like a day and a half, but, uh, Yes, there. Yes, when you are correct, when uh, when the market started to take off, if if it was November, like you said, there yeah. there's definitely bouts of wild call buying around that time frame as well. So yeah, okay. Yeah, Brad, anything else for for Jacob? No, I I feel very educated right now. <laughs> Just right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For for now, um, no, I th I think that's great. It, it I mean, like maybe we're maybe we're the counter indicators right now because everybody feels pretty bullish. Everything seems to be broadening out. Um, but I don't know. It looks pretty good right now. Yeah. yeah and, you know, the, the cabin mantra is that, you know, uh, the trend can go on for much longer than we could ever expect. So maybe this, you know, it's possible we're in the fifth inning of this bull market for all we know. So don't yeah. be uh, trying to call a top. It's, it's, it's a fool's game. Right. Yes. And the equal weight index is up six, six percent year to date. So right. you talked about, you know, the breadth uh, expanding. Um, there's a lot of unloved stocks out there, you know, even though the headline number S and P is up 17%, NASDAQ 20 plus percent. There's been, you know, as we've talked about ad nauseum on here, it's been a hand, a couple of handfuls of companies that have done most of the heavy lifting. And if it could spread to, you know, the hundred, the 490 stocks that haven't gotten as much love, that would be great. Yeah, indeed. Um, Jacob, thanks for joining. As I mentioned, uh, Jacob runs Cabot Options Trader, Cabot Options Trader Pro and Cabot Profit Booster. Uh, check them out. Uh, you can subscribe to any of them on under premium, the premium advisories page on CabotWealth.com website. Uh, thanks. And um, I hope your market monitor stays at a seven for the foreseeable future. Indeed. Have a good one, guys. Thanks. Our next guest is Tyler London, who's chief analyst of Cabot Small Cap Confidential and Cabot Early Opportunities. Uh, Tyler, this is good timing for you. Small caps, the last couple of days are up about 5%. Um, you know, yesterday in particular was interesting when the Fed uh, came out, or sorry, inflation number came out, came in cool, 3% uh, 3, 3 I believe, uh, year over year, and was negative for the first time month over month since I think 2020. Um, large caps led heavily influenced by, uh, the, the mag seven were down pretty sharply yesterday, two percent, more than 2% in the NASDAQ small caps, Russell 2000 up more than 3% up another almost 2% today. What are you seeing? What, why the divergence there? Do you think? Yeah, it's interesting. Well, first, uh, nice to see you guys, Chris and Brad. Thanks for having me on. Um, of course. Yeah. So, Chris, I was at an investment conference early yesterday morning um, for a couple hours, and that headline came in and super interesting. Um, people were talking about it right away. And it was, as you say, interesting to see that divergence. I think, you know, small caps have been under pressure and just kind of underperforming, not really doing much. They haven't been bad this year, but they've just been basically going sideways. But there is such a large amount of variable rate. Um, interest debt in the small cap index that I think when a positive CPI print comes out, you know, it's in a way it's rational to think, okay, that's going to lead to lower rates. Lower rates are going to be uh, much better for small caps than for large caps at the index level. And so we have this rally. Um, I think when you add that to how long they have underperformed for, which is honestly, it's been a couple of years now. Um, it's just like that change in like that rotation, very, very powerful. And of course, the small cap index, it doesn't take as much money moving into that to move it, um, as it would to move 
a large cap index just because the companies are so much smaller. So yeah, there's been a lot of a lot of notes out. I mean, Goldman Sachs was out with some interesting data points this morning. Uh, the 450 basis point outperformance of the Russell 2000 yesterday versus S&P 500 is the best since November of 2008. Wow. Pretty, pretty eye-opening for one day, right? Yeah. Uh, that's I mean, you've, really going back far. <laughs> you've, got so, you've got so much catch-up work to do just to get back to the historical average outperformance of small caps, um, right? Like what it's close to 2% a year that they historically outperform large caps is that about right yeah it's something in it's something in that neighborhood brad I'd... so there's just there's so much ground to cover for small caps that have been so unloved while everybody piles into that obvious ai trade um and they are like you said you know they're the they're the obvious knock on beneficiaries of interest rate cuts because that's where you're going to see the most impact on their on their fundamentals um, as opposed to somebody like an Apple or a Microsoft or an Amazon who's got you know just a a, a vault of cash available to them but I, you had mentioned before before we started recording um, that there's there's a structural advantage to trading small caps individually versus relying on that that index performance can you break that down a little bit yeah so obviously you've kind of um, you know, a little bit of a pitch embedded there for like a product like Small Cap Confidential, the advisory service that I run. Um, but I think what what I see is like you have what thirty percent or more of the market cap of the S and P five hundred allocated to like the Mag Seven. Yeah, those companies, if they release a new product like Apple is going to embed. AI features in Siri. Microsoft is doing it in Copilot and across their portfolio of products. Google, Bard, whatever. Those companies come out with new products. And we all know within like 24 hours, 48 hours, whatever, we might be using those products within days or hours of those becoming publicly available. So the scale and the reach of those companies is just massive, like around the world, everybody knows, everybody can use them almost right away. Some small cap company releases a new feature or a new product, their, their reach is just so much smaller, right? It's, it's maybe a few hundred thousand people or, or whatever, obviously depends on the company. Um, so that scale advantage, I think is one of the reasons why the mag seven is doing so well, um, not just from like a revenue and earnings perspective, but also from an investor sentiment perspective. Um, I think that when we look at the small cap index, just the way it's constituted, there's been like structural, um, I guess, headwinds in a way, um, because of how much the large cap index is allocated to the mag seven. And in the small cap, we have, we don't have anything like that on the yeah. small cap index. There's a lot of financials. There's a lot of industrials. There's a lot of materials. And those are kind of old world, you know, cyclical industries. Um, so I think that it's, I mean, fin small cap financials have done really well the last couple of days. And I think that's fantastic. Um, but I think that when, for me, at least when I'm trying to like get leverage to small caps, I look at how the index is constituted versus the large cap index. And it's just, honestly, it's not that attractive. It's not horrible. I think we should all be allocated because, you know, things change and, and whatnot, but it's much more interesting for me to say, I'm just like throwing out kind of random percentages here, but for like a small cap allocation, maybe you want to be like, 25 or 30 percent or 40 percent in a small cap index and then in individual stocks or a specialty small cap etf or mutual fund to get exposure to those areas of the small cap asset class where the action is so to speak um does that does that make sense yeah and you've got a graduation problem too where if a small cap company does release just a banger of a product and the, and the market cap starts rising, investor interest get, uh, starts rising, 
they graduate up to the mid caps. After that, they graduate up to the large caps. So basically yeah. the biggest winners out of the small cap graduate out of the ETF. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's interesting that you mentioned that. And what happens is we've seen over the last you know decade or, or so small cap indexes or uh, small cap, the average market cap in small cap indices is just creeping higher and higher and higher. And I haven't looked in a number of months, but it's, it's not small. It's not like it's 3 million or 2 million or I'm sorry, 3 billion or 2 billion average market cap size. It's like 5 billion or 7 billion. So it, that is happening a little bit slower than it used to happen. But as you say, like some of the best performing stocks move out of the index. We don't have that issue with like a advisory service, like small cap confidential. We get a company and, and it goes from 500 million to, you know, in a, in a perfect world, 10 billion, we can hold that yeah. for forever. Yeah. Are there, sorry, Chris, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, you can go ahead. Uh, I was just going to ask if there's any, if there are any sectors that really stand out to you right now, you mentioned that small cap financials had popped a little bit in the last few days. Um, but is there anything that you're targeting that you're maybe more optimistic on? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I, I tend to focus on software, medical devices, um, platform technologies. Uh, so like, you know, that might be a software, but also soft software has been challenged lately. Um, but we have like some exposure to marketing platform company, which is essentially software, but there's an AI component med tech and healthcare is always really, really interesting because there's always a lot of small, really innovative companies coming up with new devices and procedures. Um, what else do we have right now? We have, so industrials have been another big mover lately, like rate, rate sensitive companies. Um, like this isn't a small cap, but Rivian, um, is a company that I think we're all pretty familiar with. Uh, it's like a rate sensitive company, right? Kind of an industrial. Um, we have some exposure to industrials in small cap, uh, that are, doing really innovative things in with batteries um for eventually evs but also uh headsets and hopefully smartphones things like that so we have some hardware plays in there as well um, but it's really at the end of the day for me it's it's really more about the stock and the story and the growth potential than the um in the industry, really, we just added a uh, a specialty food provider that has a a niche play in like grocery stores um, and like self serve food. Uh, which again, you know, like I don't I don't know what industry you would really put that in, um, but it's kind of a specialty play. I guess it's consumer, right? Um, right. Yeah, but yeah, it's it's really stock specific. It is this it? Do you think is this the big move? Uh, the big <laughs> sort of r r rally, I guess, in small caps that we've been waiting for for a couple of years now. This is the highest uh, the Russell 2000 has been since it looks like January 2022. It's still, still below its highs from late 2021, but highest yes. it's been in, you know, two and a half years. So I'm looking at right now, Chris, I was just looking at this before we jumped on. Uh, I'm looking at the IJR, which is the small cap ETF. It's at 111.64. Uh, the high... So you're right. That's the high so far for this year. We got up to 111.16 and 111.57. So yeah, today officially uh, is the high for the year, which is amazing. Um, but we we need to see this this index, right? You know, kind of step higher, and we need to see mutual funds, big investors, start to allocate back to small cap and get some momentum. Yeah, we are talking about two days, but it's been really good two days. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot's going to come down to what the Fed does and what the Fed says and, you know, how the next CPI print is and, and all of that. But yeah, this is it's definitely encouraging. It's nice to see when you have seen an index come up against uh, overhead resistance and just fail like time and time again. It's really encouraging to see it step out a little bit. Yeah, and you mentioned the Fed. I'd be remiss if uh, before we let you go, uh, if I didn't bring it up when you, uh, I think it was when you co-hosted with me when Brad was out a month or maybe two months ago. You you thought 
no rate cuts by the Fed this year. You still think that? Oh, you guys might have to send me some hot sauce. <laughs> <laughs> are you holding to it stubbornly or are you, you shifting on that? Um, I guess I don't always say it, but whenever you, you always reserve the right to change your mind, right? Like that's right. the thing about the market is it makes you humble and you, you operate with the best information that you have at the time. And sometimes you're just dead wrong. Um, I mean, as far as the, the market, I, you're not wrong yet, technically. Yeah, that's right. I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you we may have not an 80, we have an 85% probability of a rate cut in September. Yep. Um, I, yeah, I'm going to be eating, eating those words, uh, I think, I think I'm wrong. We'll, I think I we'll was send wrong. you the hottest hot sauce. We'll, we'll bring you on for that, that episode. We'll okay. bring everyone on who says something, says something wrong, which you will probably be the whole staff, uh, when we do our <laughs> next one. Um, Tyler, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, glad that, you know, it's an exciting time for, uh, small caps. Not something I've been able to say a ton the last couple of years. So glad we could have you on. Um, if you want to read more from Tyler, Highly recommend subscribing to either uh, of his two advisories, Cabot Early Opportunities, which is not limited to small caps, uh, it's just early stage growth stocks, large or small, um, and also Cabot Small Cap Confidential, which is small cap specific. Those are both under the premium advisories tab on the cabotwealth.com website. Uh, Tyler, thanks again. All right. Thanks for having me, guys. Nice to see you again. Good to see you. You too. All right. Last but not least today on our uh Analysts sort of around the horn is Tom Hutchinson, chief analyst of our Cabot Dividend Investor and Cabot Income Advisor uh, newsletters. Uh, Tom, it, we, ever the three uh, your three predecessors on today, uh, Michael Brush, Jacob Mintz, Tyler London, have all been pretty bullish uh, to varying degrees. Um, where do you stand? What are you seeing from the market in your sort of dividend corner of the market? I've been bullied by the market into bullishness. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's just constantly better than I expect it to be. Um, you know, it was a great uh, 2023. It was a great first half of the year. And, and July looks really good. Not only that, but a lot of the rally had been almost completely driven by technology and particularly artificial intelligence. But it's really broadened out as the interest rate narrative seemingly has improved. Uh, and yesterday, you saw a huge rally uh, in stocks that have typically been underperforming this market, like REITs uh, and other interest rate sensitive stocks, because the interest rate narrative got better. Uh, the, we got another good inflation report. Uh, the consensus is now really driving toward uh, a Fed rate cut before the end of the year. So look, interest rates have peaked. Inflation seems relatively under control for now, and the economy is still good. And as long as that basic ingredient is alive and well, I think the market will continue to rally. Brad, you can relate to being bullied into bullishness. Yeah, yeah. I, you, as soon as Tom said that, I, I, I felt, uh, I, I felt seen. Um, Tom, <laughs> Tom, Tom, you've been writing for a while. Uh, that the that the rally needs to broaden out, or that it was going to peter out. Uh, um, it, you know, we talked with Tyler about seeing the IWM rally, seeing small caps rally. What are you looking at for evidence that that the broadening rally is sort of being sustained or is sustainable? Just you know, just just uh, I performance. Guess, I guess the ultimate indicator of a sustained rally would be a sustained rally i, I mean <laughs> yeah that's the obvious one right it it, lo it looks good from here um i i saw a huge jump in some of the stocks that have really not participated all year in this rally uh, that to me is an indicator that something has changed now we've seen a broadening of the rally basically for i think about a month now uh, and the uh, broadened rally is uh, has been broadening. And, and I'm encouraged because since the rally had been almost exclusively driven by tech, the rest of the market wasn't all that expensive. No. Right? You know, it's been kind of a lame recovery in the rest of the market. Yeah. Uh, so there's room for them to run. 
And as far as tech is concerned, I don't know how high this AI stuff can go. I mean, the sky's the limit. It's like wireless all over again. I'm getting flashbacks from the 90s. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, yeah. It, among the sort of unloved sectors, which is, as you mentioned, have been many, are there any in the you know, in the dividend space that you pay attention to that have really gotten a little bit more love in the last few weeks? Uh, yeah, uh, REITs. I, I mean, dividend stocks uh, are a very diverse group. Yeah. And some of them have been doing great all along. I have technology REITs that are killing it, REITs in healthcare that are killing it selectively. Uh, so there, and energy has been doing well all year. Um, at, at least the midstream dividend stocks. It's just the REITs and utilities have been sucking wind for most of the last two years. Utilities did have a pretty nice rally earlier in the year, right. but REITs had been the worst performing year to date, the worst performing over the past year. So that seems to me in the dividend realm to be ground zero. Um, and the fact that they're really perking up is very encouraging. Brad, any, any last questions for Tom? No, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, like, I feel like we're just, we're too bullish. That, that's you know, worry, right? That's, I wonder this, if, you know, yeah, that, if you're six right. people on one podcast all being bullish is, is uh, could be a sign of a top. But that's once the I, Once word, I've right? officially abandoned my bearish caution, I'd look out, you know, once they get me in. Yeah, I mean, the, seriously though, we have been we've been looking at this for you know a year, and we keep saying, hey, we need a broad rally. We talk about the equal weight needing to move higher. We need rates to come down. This is exactly the bull scenario that we have been asking for for a year, and it's here. So, yes. I guess we probably should all be bullish, even though that isn't contrarian enough for me. Well, on the one hand. You say, well, a lot of the bullishness was already priced in if you look at the indexes. But on the other hand, like I said, most of the market has been kind of lagging. No. Uh, so there's room to run there. Now, something could come along an outside event, but that's always the case. Um, anything that screws with the formula of interest rates having peaked or the economy staying out of recession, if if one of those two extremes becomes true, then look out. Yeah. But as long as we're in a happier space between those two extremes, I, I mean, I can't, I think it's going to, I think it's going to continue to be good. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see if, if the, the fed does start to cut rates in September as expected, as 85% chance now, uh, if it'll be a buy the room or sell the news situation or, 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 Maybe not even sell the news, but just a uh, shrug of the shoulders when it does happen, if it becomes so obvious in the next two months that they're going to do it. Yeah, probably. But, you know, a rate cut, big deal. OK, uh, the Fed funds rate goes from five and a half to five and a quarter percent. Oh, boy, that's going to open the floodgate. I mean, it's nothing tangible. It's right. just the fact that they're now in a... Um, an aggressive cycle of lowering rates. It's begun. And that's where, I mean, it's sort of that mentality that I think is a big deal. Right. Yeah. And of course, as soon as they cut, that speculation will be, when's the next cut? When, you know, and, and right. off to the races we are, but it's a better place to be once they start cutting. Very true. Um, well, you can read more from Tom. Uh, as I mentioned, he, he runs our Cabot Dividend Investor and Cabot Income Advisor newsletter. So you can find them on the uh, Premium Advisories tab on the CabotWealth.com website. Tom, thanks for joining us. Uh, enjoy the rest of your summer. And I hope uh, I hope we'll all be just as bullish and positive uh, the next time we have you on. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> uh, good to be with you. All right. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, everyone, for joining Street thanks. Check this week. We'll see you next week.